So this morning, um, what we're going to do is have a, a, a series of three speakers, and after that, um, we're going to have a Q&A. So we, and we'll just have everybody raise their hands, and, the, and I'll bring this microphone over to you so that you can speak into the microphone, and that way everybody in the room can, can hear your question as well as the answer. So today we are favored with three speakers who will talk about the Ridgeway State Park. The first speaker is Jim Austin, longtime resident. He was born in Wichita, Kansas, and went on to earn his bachelor's degree in business and journalism from the University of Kansas in 1960. After earning his master's degree in public administration from KU in 1962, he accepted a position as an assistant manager in Emporia, Kansas. Austin went on to work all over the country, including Montrose as its city manager from approximately 1969 to 1979. Then our next speaker is Mike Berry, and he is the general manager of Tri-County Water Conservation Conservancy District from 1994 to present. Then finally, we will have Jeff Riddell and Kirsten Copeland, who are both park managers. Jeff Riddell was the park manager when the Ridgeway State Park first opened up. And Kirsten Copeland is our current parks manager at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. She graduated from the University of Colorado Boulder with a BA in environmental conservation. So we will start with Jim Austin. Jim will tell us about before the government approved the dam and reservoir, why Montrose needed the dam, and what they had to do to get the approval. Then we will have Mike Berry, the general manager of Tri County Water, and he will provide information about the dam structure and build out information about how Tri County manages the water, as well as any information regarding the hydro. And then we will conclude with Kirsten Copeland, the parks manager at Ridgeway State Park. She will talk about the features and recreational opportunities at the park. So let's start with Jim Austin. Really? Is that loud enough, Phil? Phil, Phil, is that loud enough? What? You can hear. You can hear. You can hear. Hot chalk. You can hear. <laughs> Is that better, Bill? There you go, Jim. There you go. It's not too loud. You can't hear. <laughs> all right. I'll do, do two things. First of all, I brought plenty of cup. Well, look at this car. How would you ever get in that? Uh, I got plenty of copies of the contract to see if my friend entered into to get the Dallas water. I said, I'm stable. So I give them to you and you separate them and get plenty of out there. Remember it costs a lot of copy. Alright, what we want to start out here with, I'm supposed to talk about the maps. Judy gave me a bunch of mice on the files. But I went to look for them this morning and only find three. And I got to thinking about the three blind mice. You know Mike? The problem we have is, how can I put that in my pocket with the mic? <laughs> There's the, uh, get the three ladies that don't have the mouse. Mike, what's the paragraph? 18 or 19? 16. 15? 1 6. 16. How many of you know what's in the Tri County <coughs> contract paragraph 16? It's a paragraph in the contract that says Montrose is better than Delta. <laughs> it is a, oh, I have a not strong sentence. I know my wife shirt because when you're speaking to Kathy or part of your mind, you got to play it pretty straight. But I really would like to have, I would like to have my name be Dell. When I, when I started my master's program at KU, the professor started out with a little poem. It's 
says, I cannot, I cannot blow the whistle, I cannot ring the bell, or let the darn thing jump the track and guess who catches heck. <laughs> See, I'll get it. How much you need to Sure, you know. All right, next up, guys, I'm going to tell you what you're going to be in Bob Strong. Do you all know Bob Strong? Hold your hand up, Bob. Good. Bob Kinkle was on that case, so hold your hand up, Bill. Those two approved that contract. So they're still alive. So what's happening is the authority to manage the water has moved toward Grant County and Project 7. Does everybody here know what Project 7 is? Nobody knows what Project 7 is? The problem that we have is Project 7 divided into seven equal units. And when I first came along with the council a few years back, but nobody's on it now. That wants to make Montrose unequal, to make Montrose stronger than the other six. It's a stupid paragraph. I don't want to change it. I don't have opinions for it. Now, you want to know about the mouse? The mouse was created by uh, Taylor. Uh, but you really want to know about the dam. I want to tell you about water. Let me give you a number. A billion, three hundred and fifty-eight billion, six hundred and ninety-eight gallons of water last year was produced by the first month of Now, your water is guaranteed from now until 200 years from now. You got plenty of water because of those two people that are still alive. I tried to find a boy and I couldn't find the boy Brown would be the next one. So you have water that lasts you for centuries. We kept reoccurring, re reoccurring in the lake. But if you notice that contract, that contract is with Tri-County Water. So it's going to move toward Pike Barry. And I'm not so sure that you're not going to pay the price for putting that section 16 in that stupid contract. Uh, so, if we were going to do the reservoir, I'd have to tell you it's a bunch of names. Dick Edmondson was one of them. The main one was probably Harold Wesson. Does anybody here remember Harold Wesson? See, Tricia does. Harold is a wonderful man, and he stuck with this project by the hour. Now, I'm going to do 10 minutes. How many have I taken? <laughs> Come on, you lie. <laughs> I don't have to keep going. Uh, anyway, natural water. Let's, let's talk about just a second why my cruise is unique. You're unique because you bought the water years before you needed it, almost a century. These people signed contract for water almost 100 years before they're going to need it. And they really ought to be respected for that. You've got the You've got the best internet speed in the United States. There's no city your size in the United States that has internet speed as secure and as fast as you do. Bill Patterson, who's not here this morning, I would think, probably because he didn't want to learn anything. Uh, Bill Patterson comes to us with the idea that we can produce our own power using the water we own in the Dallas running a stretch for a and providing power for Montrose would take us off the national grid. We wouldn't buy power from anyone. We produce our own. And so you're unique. You're unique because you live in the G mug. Does everybody, does everybody know what the G mug is? Anybody know what it is? It's a beer. Okay. That <laughs> too. It's the Grand Mason and the Potter. Because of some things before. That dwarf is the largest federally managed public recreation area in the United States. Not in the world, so I very much want to argue. 
So you've got a lot of things going for you. And one thing I think we need to emphasize, and I'd like to finish today on, is we ought to be able to work together. You know, anybody that thinks he has the upper hand on one of these subjects ought to get his head in the right place. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> you were going to say something I didn't say. The reservoir battle started 40 years before the reservoir was built. It started with trying to get a Congress to appropriate the money to build the reservoir. That took 38 years. Then Jimmy Carter was elected. I doubt if anybody here knows that Jimmy Carter fished here every year. Every year, every year, it went down the river, down the bottom of the canyon to fish. Anyhow, Carter's staff said nine reservoirs didn't need to be built. Said the nine reservoirs were a waste of money. And that staff canceled the nine reservoirs, including the Dallas. And we got the Dallas approved in the battle. He had to understand that we were laughing at him. Two of us have worked with Carter earlier, and we knew that he hated, hated to be laughed at. Really, Carter was describing my very crazy laughing at him. So that's why the mouse came along. It was an idea that made everybody laugh. No, he didn't like to be laughed at. Anyway, the Dallas is the only one of the nine reservoirs is built. The other reservoir, eight reservoirs, now we talk about it. This is 80 years later. We're still talking about the other eight reservoirs. That's all I'm going to tell you, because I'm out of time. If you want to serve them, I'll give you a baptism. <laughs> I think I want to know more about the mouse afterwards. I know where the sculpture is. It's not my target, right? Yep. Do you want to know more about the mouse? County's uh, Water Conservancy District. Uh, we were born in 1958. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's go back. That's my presentation. <laughs> Tile 37, Colorado by statute, um, yeah, and that, that was uh, devised back in, I think, 1937. We have a 15-member court-appointed board, so the state district court appoints our boards. We have five members from three counties, uh, Delta, Montrose, and Uray. And we are, we're not a private utility like DMEA or uh, CenturyLink or Black Hills, we are, we are a local government <clears throat> and considered to some degree to be a utility. And that is our primary business is domestic water. We do collect property tax from all of you who live in this valley with the exemption, there's a few exemptions around, but not very many. And we're, we're tax exempt nonprofit. 
So a little history about Tri-County. The, the project started back in the 1940s, the Dallas Creek Project. It was called something else. I think it was called the Urine County Project or something. And, uh, and the Bureau of Reclamation started studying the opportunities to store and use water in the Upper Hook of Padre Basin. Um, Tri-County was born in 1957. And it wasn't until 1968 when the Dallas Creek Project was authorized by the U.S. Congress. Then, uh, at the same time, Tri-County started to build their original domestic water system, which essentially delivered water from the Cologne area to uh, Delta. Well, that was our original system, but we've expanded it since then. And... Uh, uh, back in 1976, I believe Jim might have touched on this a little bit, voters approved a contract to repay the federal government for uh, the Dallas Creek, or the construction of the Dallas Creek Project. Project 7 was established in 1977. They had a groundbreaking in 78. That is the groundbreaking ceremony. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this. Construction of the dam was was completed in 1987, started in 1978, and they uh, first filled the reservoir in 1990. That's when Tribe County took over the operation and maintenance responsibility um, at Ridgeway. So this is just a, a quick look at District County. I know this is hard to uh, to see back in the back, but this is the Gunnison River. This is Red Mountain Pass. This basically is the line of mountains that you see to the east. And this is the top of the Uncompahgre Plateau. So the Uncompahgre River drainage is essentially the Tri-County Water Conservancy District boundary. Once upon a time, we had 1,200 taps, 280 miles of pipeline, a couple of pump stations, and three tanks. Today, we're uh, it's actually a approaching 7,700 taps, 620 miles of pipeline, all kinds of pump stations, and 22 um, storage tanks. Most of them are steel. And this is what we do for a living for the most part. That's 95% of our business. The other 5% is to take care of the project that supplies water to the people that drink it here in, in the valley. So I'll mm -hmm. picture Ridgeway Dam. You notice this was before the hydropower plant was uh, um, built. And the hydropower plant was built right down in this area, which is basically what they call the right downstream of Button. There's a little statistic about Ridgeway Dam. It's 330 <coughs> feet in height from the base, which is the keyway that's buried in the ground, to uh, the top of the dam. It's about a half a mile wide. It's Crest elevation is that, 68-90 approximately. Our outlet works capacity is about 1,500 CFS, so we can control about 1,500 uh, cubic feet per second through the, through the structure. It has an uncontrolled spillway uh, capacity around almost 10,000 CFS. And if that happened, we'd all be kind of wet down here. <laughs> the river down there that's usually about 50 feet wide would be probably 300 feet wide. Uh, and it's about 1,000 acres, and it stores about 84,000 acre feet of water. So Jim alluded to this a little bit. Project 7 was created back in 1977, 76-77, and there's six entities that take water from, uh, or, or, or delivered water by Project 7. Project 7 basically treats our water. Tri-County owns it. Project 7 treats it. We all share it. Uh, the cities of Montrose and Delta, Town of Olathe, Chapita Water District, the Token Water District, and Tri-County all share 28,000 acre feet of municipal industrial water. Okay, so we all have our allocated portion. Tri-County and the city of Montrose have the lion's share of that, about 23,000 acre feet. Um, the Yucca Park and Valley Water Users Association has 11,200 acre feet of irrigation water in the, in the reservoir. 
we exchange with the water users. The water users deliver water to the Project 7 water treatment plant in the town. And we exchange 10,000 acre feet, approximately 10,000 acre feet a year, out of that MI pool and deliver it down the river so that the Uncompahgre Valley water users can divert to the irrigators of the Uncompahgre uh, uh, Valley. None of us drink any water out of the Uncompahgre River. It all comes from the Gunnison, through the Gunnison Tunnel, through the original Uncompahgre project. Okay? Uh, and there's about 55,000 acre feet of active storage in that, which means that reservoir could float up and down probably two thirds its depth. And it has, this year it was close. We came pretty close to two thirds of its depth um, before, before we had such a great winter. But 35 year average supply for the project is about 100,000 acre feet. And that's an April 1 through July 31st runoff period, they call it. So that's the period of time when we get all the water from the snowpack that generally this year was the craziest year ever. Um, there's still snow up there. I talked to a guy in Ophir the other day, and he's still got snow in his front yard. And I said, "You're probably gonna, you know, we're probably gonna carry over some of the snowpack, which is hasn't been hasn't happened in a long, long time." Average runoff about 140,000 acre feet of water on a yearly basis. Okay, so so the project holds 85. We get about 140 every year. We pass everything that we can't store, and we make power with it. So back in 19, well, 1984, we did our original study on uh, hydropower Ridgeway. And we went through a series of studies, 84, 96, 2003, 2009, 10. Finally, in 2012, we finally put a contract together <coughs> And we got the lease of power privilege, which is the Bureau's license to build a private um, hydropower facility on a federal project. It's called a lease of power privilege. You've heard, probably heard of a FERC permit. Well, it's very similar, except FERC permits are issued by, I think, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Bureau issues lease of power privilege. So we built a, a plant up there. It has a total uh, capacity of 8 megawatts. It produces about 24,000 megawatt hours a year, which can power about 2,400 houses per year. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, the clean and renewable aspect of this project saves about uh, 50, I think it's 50 million pounds of carbon a year, which is about about the, the amount of carbon that uh, 4,400 cars put out in a, in a year. We have two units. We have a 7.2 megawatt unit and we have a uh, 0.8 megawatt or 800 kilowatt unit. We run, uh, well, we run the big one in the summer. We run both of them this summer and typically we do run both of them for a period of the summer. Uh, we run the big one typically in the summer, and we run the smaller unit in the winter. So we take our winter flows, put it through a smaller unit. We still produce power all year round. But uh, the combined uh, releases of irrigation uh, typically power both units for a couple to three months out of the summer. And on the fringe of that, we run the big unit, and during the winter, we run the little unit. So that's, uh, that's a picture of what they look like. They look like those lunar landing uh, <laughs> capsules. <laughs> that's what it looks like to me. This is the small unit. This is the, uh, the uh, 0.8 or 800 kilowatt unit. And this is the bigger unit. Nine times the size in power output, but it's only about twice as big physically. <clears throat> And this is a picture from the top of the dam on the right abutment, uh, looking down at the emergency spillway, our stilling basin right here. This is the powerhouse. This is the transformer that transforms the power that we produce here to line voltage, which is 1.15 kV. Um, I say it right. I'm sure. Um, 
we put out 4,160 volts, and we bump it up to 1.15. I think that's right. And then it goes out on a transmission line to a tri-state uh, transmission and generation transmission um, substation, which is right there. And then it goes out to the grid. So we own everything that's down here. That's our field station. That's where our game tenders house. Uh, we own everything down here, and Tri-State owns this, and they own all the lines that, that carries the, the power. <coughs> we have two power purchasers. One is the city of Aspen. They, they purchase our winter power, and Tri-State actually purchases our summer power from June 1 to October 1 or September 30th. Like I say, we put out about 24 thousand megawatt hours a year. Um, I want to tell you about a couple of things that are going on in the water world locally. Back in 2013, oops, oh man, come on. <laughs> this is important stuff, I gotta get it back up here. Two things that we're doing. The acquired by water users in Tri-County, along with Reclamation, back in 2013, put a group together to talk about the future of the water in this valley. Jim alluded to the fact that we have a lot of water in this valley, and it's precious, and it's important because all of the water that comes to the Uncle Pirate Project, which is the original one, uh, uh, one of Reclamation's original projects, is senior to the Colorado River Compact. So, in my opinion, personal opinion, not, not necessarily Tri County's opinion, I think it's the valley's savior for, in, in perpetuity. Uh, so, we're talking about the use of that water and what we can do with it, how we can protect it, how we can save it, what's, a, what's the best thing to do with it. So, we're talking about wise water use. Just recently, we put together a group of the city and county governments, along with their staffs and a selected few off the Incompagre and the Tri-County Board to talk about water and land use policy. And we're, we're trying, because those two are so interrelated and so important, we're gonna try and see if we can make a difference for the future um, as a group. So we've started a, a discussion and I think it's, there's a lot of energy behind it. If anybody's interested in uh, getting involved in something like that. I think we would welcome your input. Uh, some of these meetings are long and boring, so you got to be, you know, quick on the draw, get in, get out kind of thing. But uh, there's my contact information. If anybody in this room wants to talk to me about water, um, you can email me at mikeTriCountyWater.org or, or call the office. I'd be glad to talk to you. So I love, I love hearing your input. Any questions? Oh, you've been instructed to wait. All right. Well, then I'm the current park manager at Ridgeway, but I have the great honor of asking, and uh, he was generous enough to come, the original park manager, the one who opened the park, Jeff Riddle. So I'd like to let him lead off. So go ahead. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Um, I uh, graduated and started my career in outdoor recreation in 1978. Graduated from Colorado State University, go Rams. I heard uh, Rock Chalk mentioned earlier, and I don't know, um, Bill, you'd probably prefer just to skip right over football season and go straight to basketball season. You're, I don't think they'll let you do You're that. right, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> I uh, competed for and was uh, awarded the position of the uh, first park manager at Ridgeway State Park in 1989. And I hooped and hollered and did the happy dance for about two weeks. And then I came over and started my new position. I was welcomed into this community in 1989 in a very big way. And as Jim alluded to earlier, a lot of that was carryover from the community support for the water storage project. But at this point, when I showed up, the heavy lifting was done. Jim had done his work. Mike was finished. And now it's playtime. Let's get the park open and let's
let's get the recreation going. So in uh, August of uh, 1989, well, we were actually under construction there from 87 until 89. And as the park was being built, uh, a little more local pressure built up for when are you going to open this thing. We've got a lot invested in this. People were anxious. The parks, they were stocking the reservoir in 1987. People were driving by on Highway 550 and seeing those fish rise. They wanted in there. We have the deer fence around the reservoir, but it's not a people fence, and fishermen found their way in before we were open, and some of you look familiar to me. <laughs> so, uh, are you the, do you have the, the okay, good. Um, uh, this, this will be a good scenario, I think. Let's, let me just uh, mention now that the uh, mission of Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, it's to perpetuate the wildlife resources of the state, to provide a quality state park system, and to provide enjoyable and sustainable outdoor recreation opportunities that educate and inspire current and future generations to serve as active stewards of Colorado's natural resources. And, and I really like that last statement, uh, to educate and inspire future generations because that's, that's really what a lot of this is about is preserving this site and maintaining it for our kids and our grandkids to enjoy. Very uh, photogenic park as you all know, pretty picture there of uh, looks like maybe the uh, main cove. As we mentioned it opened in 1989, uh, the, it was funded and built by the Bureau of Reclamation. A lot of folks don't know that. When we first opened, they assumed that Colorado lottery dollars paid for the development of the park. That's not the case. Our federal partner, the Bureau of Reclamation, funded the cost of all construction at the state park. And our partnership agreement is that all revenue that is made there through the sales of passes and camping permits is returned back to operating the park. But the Bureau of Reclamation funded everything. Uh, total cost on the project, including waterworks, $181 million. $21 million was spent for recreation facilities. The original recreation budget was $10 million. As we opened areas at the park and had such great feedback from recreationists, we had folks come in and say, we've been camping 30 years, this is the best park we've ever been in. We went back to the Bureau of Reclamation and said, hey guys, we're on to something really special here, but we're going to need a little more money to finish this. <laughs> it's not us saying that, it's the visitors, right? So we went back to our planning group, and they continued to raise that budget and, and provide for the quality of uh, facility that you see there today. Okay, let's do the next one. And how the park is operated is uh, the, Bureau, the Bureau of Reclamation still owns underlying property, as uh, Mike talked about. Tri-County operates the dam and the hydro. And then uh, CPW, Parks and Wildlife, manages the recreation, natural, and cultural resources, as well as the public safety aspects of the park. Next, please. Yeah, we'll stay. Let's stay on that. Okay. So as most of you are familiar with the outline of the reservoir, and I'm probably blocking the view of some of you over here, I apologize. Um, from south to north, looking left to right, the bold line on the right, of course, is the dam, and then on the south end is uh, the end. The project boundary is about seven miles from end to end. When the reservoir is completely full, it's about five miles long. It's a thousand surface acres. Uh, our soft opening in 1989 was at the Dutch Charlie site. Where's the pointer, Mike, in the middle? Mike, where's the pointer? Yeah, it's in the middle, but unless the pointer is there. You go. Okay, right here is Dutch Charlie, and this includes the park headquarters, two different campgrounds. And, and one of the, the appealing things about this development, I think, is that the sites offer 
almost a different setting, like three separate parks in one. So in Dutch Charlie, here's Dakota Terrace's campground. Folks are close to the edge of the water and a trail access to the swim beach and boat ramp. Up on top here is Elk Ridge, one of our most popular campgrounds. It's separate from the hustle and bustle of the main area, and it has outstanding views of the Sneffels Range. So two very distinct uh, locations and feel for camping. We feature one of the longest boat ramps in Colorado. It's located right here. That ramp go, extends from this site all the way out to the main body of the reservoir. And I believe there is still a legal minimum drawdown on the reservoir. If that's still in place. Use that word legal, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a friendly agreement that we don't take this thing down. More than 90 feet is what we we uh, told people early, uh, and we had some drought years in the 90s when we first opened, so a uh, 90-foot drawdown would completely dry up this main cove, but this boat ramp would extend all the way down to the main reservoir. It narrows down from four lanes to two and actually makes a bend around the corner, so you can pretty much always launch boats at Ridgeway. And that's not the case in a lot of reservoirs that, we, that are managed in Colorado. Okay, so that, that was 1989, August. We closed, we, we hustled, got some more construction done, and Dutch Charlie was ready for the grand opening in 1990. The next site down here on the south end is Dallas Creek. That's day use only, there are no camping down there. That features uh, extensive trail development, concrete, as well as natural trails down in here. And uh, there are two bridges. One goes across the Uncompahgre River, the other across Dallas Creek. Those are the two drainages that feed the reservoir. Again, a, a separate feel and ambiance of, of a park area down here as compared to the busy site. So we used to tell folks, if, if you feel a little bit crowded on Fourth of July weekend or major holidays, try this area because the crowds aren't near so bad. Very good fishing down here, river fishing. That's where the staff goes. I wasn't supposed to tell you guys that. <laughs> it, it's a very good secluded area, good bird watching natural area. This site opened June of 1992. The final major development is Paco Chupa, down below the dam. Most people call it Paco, uh, abbreviated. This site opened July 2nd, 2000, no, 1994. July 2nd. I have to mention that because <laughs> what were we thinking? Uh, Open two days before the 4th of July holiday. We had a uh, full hookup uh, camping. We had a, a major uh, temper services building with laundromat and vending, playgrounds for the kids, and a large group picnic area right here. And uh, we wanted folks to use it and enjoy it. And, <clears throat> and start to generate some revenue from the investment of this recreation facility. And luckily things went well, so we had a good opening in, in 94. This park, um, if you look at this site facility grid right here, you'll notice how many of these blocks are shaded in, and it's, it, it's one of the few state parks anywhere in the country, I believe, that offers such a wide variety of recreation activity. Most will have maybe half of this, but with these three distinct sites and, and the level of our construction that went in, it's, uh, it's special to be able to offer this much variety. So, with that. All right, we'll stay up here. Let me see if I go the right way. Um, let's see. So this is just to give you a quick overview of the variety of things that we are responsible for taking care of. Um, all the natural resource stuff, um, which includes vegetation, geology, different kinds of living critters. And then we do have some cultural resources on the park, which um, we've in, been able to interpret some of them, but some of them we're still learning about. Um, invasive species, that's a big deal. You guys have all heard of zebra mussels. Boat inspections, that's been a big topic between us and Tri-County, actually, is keeping those out of Ridgeway Reservoir. 
And then this is kind of the totality of our recreational facilities, almost 300 campsites, 15 miles of trail. We now have two swim areas. Um, one is a sandy traditional beach, and then the other is kind of a, as we grew up, uh, fend for yourself at the South Shore with hooks and dogs and everything else swimming area. A um, bunch of playgrounds, a bunch of picnic areas. And then the reservoir um, and uh, group facilities, we have a lot of weddings, family reunions, uh, company picnics, birthdays, things like that. Um, and now we have, um, we have buoy and slip rentals. We just added boat rentals about three weeks ago, finally, after many, many years. So we rent pontoon boats and then pedal, like you see in the old city parks. And then there's two private vendors on site now that rent paddle boards and kayaks. And if you guys have seen the lake anytime recently, paddle boarding is like, I don't even know how to describe it. It is a huge, huge change in our industry. It is uh, predominantly the newest thing coming. So this is what we have to get everything done. Um, we've talked a lot about what the Bureau invested in the facilities, and they are fantastic. And our team of um, eight now, eight and a half people, we have a half-time marina manager. Um, and then we bring on about 30 paid staff and um, at least um, another 30 uh, volunteer staff. Our high point of volunteer hours contributed is 21,000. We have the second highest number of volunteer hours of any state park in Colorado. The only one that out competes us is uh, Cherry Creek and they're right in the middle of Denver, so I don't think it's really fair. <laughs> and I, I argue some of theirs are court order, by the way. But anyway. <laughs> it is in order, so. Um, we have a really strong um, environmental ed program, too, that's been going for many, many years, started by a really talented person named Cheryl Radovich, who some of you may know. She was a local educator. Her husband, Don Radovich, is a fantastic birding illustrator and things. But anyway, we've had only three educators in the history of the park, and they all are traditional education um, folks, and they have done a great job. We have good support from our extended network into the region. And then, um, you know, I don't want to say Ridgeway's budget is uh, fantastic, but I would say that Ridgeway has proven itself worthy of supporting um, because we turn what we are given in financial and equipment resources and human resources, and we exponentially um, produce out of that. So starting with when Jeff was in charge of it all. This is just to give you guys kind of um, a breakdown of where we spend our money. Um, so people. People, we are a service industry, um, so a lot of what we do is people, public safety, public customer service, and then our technician team, I would put up against any team in the whole country. Um, they can fix and, and uh, innovate anything I've come to learn. And then it is uh, down to capital, which is that big red piece, so that's investing in our facilities as we go on, and it kind of breaks down from there. Um, this is our, our financial revenue breakdown. The majority of our revenue comes from camping currently, um, those almost 300 campsites, it flipped at one point. It used to be parks passes predominantly and camping, and, and now that's flipped. I expect that marina number to go up quite a bit as time goes on. And then our previous high point was 1.6 million. Um, I haven't been able to gather revenue figures since we switched uh, computer systems, so I don't know where we went in uh, 18 and 19, but I will tell you, even with the drought, campgrounds were full in 18. The day use was, was very good, but the campgrounds were full. People come to the San Juans is one of the messages I would give. Uh, they come to be in the area, and it's our job to treat them well enough that they want to come back and stay with us every time they come to this area. So, Here's some of our challenges. Um, we do have visitation increases. Um, compared to when the park was first built, we're accommodating a lot more whoops, people. Um, there are some things, the boat rentals were one of them, and we just got that met. Um, the other thing is a group campground, so unmet services. Um, we are always, you know, up against budget restrictions. Conflicting uses is an interesting thing. Um, so on the water, for instance, paddle crafters apparently are giving dirty looks at the motorized users. I just had somebody tell me that the other day. I said, why don't you guys go that way? Oh, no, the paddle boarders glare at us. We don't like to. <laughs> so, and the same thing with trails. you got bikes flying by people on foot, or you've got hunters who have been there for many generations that are now being um, interacting with folks from areas that didn't grow up hunting, and they're astonished that there are hunters on the park. So, you know, we're really trying to always um, help folks understand the multi-purpose nature of what we do. And then um, safety, and I will say, and I should knock on wood, but traditionally Ridgeway um, does not have a lot of uh, criminal type issues. Um, it's very atypical. And uh, we do a lot of medical responses, and we work very closely with Erie County on that. 
Um, and then keeping our resources protected, keeping people from driving into the vegetation or cutting off tree limbs, stuff like that. Dogs, dogs are a big part of what we do. So um, we're going to be working with a statewide park management plan. We're going to try and get some uh, unmet facilities met. And I guess that's it. I wanted to throw a couple of things in related to uh, Jim. Uh, the Montrose Mouse is a fantastic story, and I did not know about it for many, many years. And then um, Mike King's mom, Polly, and I were in a lunch line together, if anybody knows Polly King. And she not only told me the story, but she even used her middle finger to tell me the story. <laughs> so I was pretty amazed by that. But um, I have in my office, thanks to Mayor Strong, a vial with the little tab, if anyone's seen it, that said, Dear, Dear President Carter, if you don't need the water, then send us yours. And they sent empty vials right to the White House. I have that, thanks to Mayor Strong. And I also have one of the cool banners that was put up. Um, and uh, so if anyone is in the office at Ridgeway State Park and wants to see those, those are very cherished and will be very well taken care of. And we appreciate having them because that's such a great story. And I try and tell it now, the Looney Bean Mouse, the Montrose Mouse. So <laughs> most of you probably know that. Um, and then the only other thing I was going to throw in on Mike's presentation is that, um, and Jeff, the first one of these complaints, how can we let the water out? We bought the house on Log Hill and we were depending on this full reservoir so that we have great views the whole time. <laughs> Like, they don't get that recreation was the add-on. And we battle that misconception a lot. Water storage was the real reason behind it, but people are often just, and last year, why do you keep letting water out during the drought? So anyway, it's a constant education push. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good to have um, all the presenters come up here and so we can have some questions at the restaurant. So Jim. I would love to hear a little bit more about the Montrose Mouse. Could you come up and tell us a little bit more about that? And then the rest of the presenters, please. Okay, I'll take the mic to you. Paragraph 
Okay. Paragraph 16 is a clause in a contract that was basically a, a, a clause that allowed the four entities that signed uh, signed up for the project. It was Olathe, it was the municipality. It was basically Tri-County, uh, uh, Montrose, Delta, and Olathe had a contract with a clause in it that said that if any one of you entities sell your water to someone else, the other three get to share in the profit. So on an annual basis, uh, Tri-County sells about 123 acre-feet of, of augmentation water. Out of that municipal industrial pool that uh, I mentioned earlier, and we have to pay the other three entities a proportionate share of the benefits of that sale, and so it's it's uh, just a, like a uh, what do you call it revenue sharing clause in a contract that doesn't amount to a lot of money. But it, uh, it does impact the decisions of all those entities on what they might do with their water in the future, I think. About, that's about the bottom line of it. Any other questions? So Mike, you mentioned the amount of water that Montrose has rights to. What population would that support if millions of people moved here tomorrow? How many could we support without water? Well, there's 28,000 acre feet of water, and depending on whose equation you use, uh, a, an acre foot of water can support basically four people for a year, and that supports not only their domestic or their household needs, but their irrigation needs, and their commercial needs, Walmart, City Market, gas station, whoever else needs water. Uh, so I once sort of said that it would be about 150,000 people probably is what the 28,000 would support. And as those people move in, and that's what this Water for the Future group is talking about, is the conversion of the irrigation supply to a municipal supply and how we're going to convert the use of the water into the future from a farm to a subdivision. So we're talking about that right now, trying to figure out exactly how we would do that and what's the smartest thing to do with that water so that we don't make some of the mistakes that maybe the Front Range has made or some of the mistakes that even, you know, a, a sister valley down here in the Grand Valley, I grew up there, and uh, we made a lot of mistakes. So I'm inviting those people into the room to have the conversation about the mistakes that were made so we don't make them like they did. That's one of my thoughts, um, and, and we're trying to get that done. I have a question regarding fee structure, and I may be wrong, but I think I remember initially we paid less for the water than we do now, and the fee was to escalate over time. Will it, is that correct and will it continue to escalate? Well, there's a lot of components in fees and fee structures. What you're referring to, I think, is uh, the first 10 years of our payback to the Bureau of Reclamation as a group, all six <laughs> entities. Our, our first 10 years was a development period and so at the start we didn't pay as much in 1990 but by by 2000 we were paying what they had expected us to pay for the next 40 years and then in 19 or 20 and 39 we're going to go backwards as far as repayment of the contract to Bureau reclamation if you're referring to operation and maintenance fees which is what supports my staff and our efforts to serve people water in this valley those are ongoing things and they're going to escalate. Everything gets more expensive as time goes on, just the way it is, and everybody in this room knows it. Uh, but we try to hold those uh, operation maintenance fees down to a minimum. But yes, they will, they will your cost of water will continue to go up into the future, and um, there's probably nothing on this planet that won't. Thank you. 
A question for Mr. Riddell. Um, what does Pakachupak mean and how did you come up with that name? <laughs> I think we just hit our time limit. <laughs> Um, and, and we heard that a lot when we opened the area, so no question about it. Um, when we were developing the park, we had different uh, preliminary names for each of the sites that were identified, Dutch Charlie, Dallas Creek, and then we called the one below the dam, Cow Creek. There was uh, a teacher in town and, and, and some of the students who were talking about what was going on, they didn't especially like the name Alkali Creek. So they approached our planning team and asked if they could have a community site naming contest to come up with some better names. And uh, it was agreed upon and in the local schools they got the, the children involved. They selected Dutch Charlie, who was a historical figure with a, a way station uh, in, in the basin. Dallas Creek, of course, the city of Dallas and the drainage of Dallas. And then a uh, young uh, Native American girl approached her grandfather in Ignacio and asked him, what is the Indian term for Cow Creek? And his response after a while contemplating uh, talking to his granddaughter was Paco Chupa, and that was submitted and selected. And um, when I came in, uh, I was a little taken aback by that, but then when I heard the history behind it, we uh, took, tried to take advantage of that and identify the history of the Native American culture in the area with some signage there. So if you go down to the picnic area, you'll see some of those displays and signs. Pakwachupak, the southern Indian term for cow creek. And the iterations that we've heard over the years have been really entertaining, just like Uray, right? Um, but my favorite I just had to share with you is Poka Chipmunk. <laughs> To be cognizant of everybody's time, we, we need to stop because we'd like to just stop right at 9 o'clock. And, and we thank you all so much for all your presentations. Let's give them all a big applause. And now to tell us about what's happening next week. Can you